uh, keeping, keeping cyber secure and adhering to data privacy. So I'll reintroduce Kat, ladies first. Kat Code is a privacy and regulations senior consultant and the owner of Binary Tattoo. An engineer and software architect, Kat Code has spent two decades working at tech companies in roles from software developer to senior management. In 2013, Kat rec recognized the need for people to better understand the importance of their digital data and how to keep it safe. Combining her love for teaching and her background in tech, Kat launched Binary Tattoo. Binary for all things digital and tattoo for the permanence of what we put online. These days, Kat specializes in guiding companies through their global privacy regulation compliance, such as GDPR, PIPEDA, CCPA, HIPAA, LGPD, et cetera. She is certified in Canadian privacy law from the International Association of Privacy Professionals and is a member of the Standards Council of Canada Committee on the Global Data Protection. Gilad Perry is the owner and founder of Armour Cybersecurity. Armour Cybersecurity is a Toronto-based boutique cybersecurity company which aims to help clients stay protected from the ever-changing cyber threat. Armour Cybersecurity leverages the best talent in cybersecurity industry along with leading technologies from cyber capital of the world, Israel. All their resources are coming with a military background and multi-year hands-on experience at cyber warfare and defense at the state level. Okay, guys, take it away. Thank you. Let me share my screen and then we will start uh, with the share button. Okay, let me know. I guess everyone can see my screen. Uh, good. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming tonight. Um, I think what we're going to review today is if my mouse will start moving. Okay, so what we want to cover today is just give you a bit of an overview um, of the threat landscape. So, you know, what we're seeing out there and uh, give you some understanding of how hackers are actually working and how you guys can defend yourself against uh, against it because this uh, is a today a really growing um, industry uh, if you can call it an industry uh, it's actually one of the most profitable industries out there today so just let's talk about uh, what we see in the third landscape so you know just things that we see in um, in the in the recent news right so you know we see um, Hackers and that would just take took over. Uh, to, that was just about a month ago. Uh, threatened to lead to leak Kemper, and if you guys don't have Kemper in the U.S., Kemper is a big shipping company, uh, in um, and and similar extortions uh, to to leak their data. We actually see these type of extortions actually happening with 2.3 billion costs a year. So whether you are um, a shopping site where you're a law firm, or it can even be to a dental office where someone's going to get hold of all your customer data and now, you know, threaten to, to use that um, and expose it outside or, or, or use this data. Uh, Life Labs is a, a huge uh, company here that uh, in Canada they do, um, I assume there's people from the US, that's why I'm good, uh, this, uh, mentioning from Canada, it's a huge um, the facility that does uh, blood tests, but blood, blood work is a lab. Uh, and again, 15 million Canadians information was actually stolen. And when, when this type of things happen, we need to understand that the reason hackers do that, and we'll get to it a bit later, is that essentially, um, I'm sure that most of the many people using uh, Life Labs that had to go in even once in their life and check their um, Check their, they probably logged in, you had to log in, create a username. For 90%, they're probably using the same login email that they're using across other websites. And I would say that probably 85% of the time they're actually using the same information, the same password, because who can remember all these hundreds of passwords when they log into other websites? So a lot of this harvesting of information, in this case, is in order to later on be able to execute actual additional attacks and also uh, for, for the purpose of uh, the, above, the point above actually extorting a company like Life Lab, they probably requested a lot of money for this information, et cetera. So we're seeing all these attacks and these attacks are happening 
not just on small company uh, on small practices like like uh, dental office law firms, but also um, organizations like Life Labs, like CRA, which is our revenue agency, which just happened uh, about uh, two months ago, where they actually 5,600 accounts were actually impacted. And the impact that we see of those um, attacks are are are, are, across, are have many many ramifications. Like we saw Verizon actually paid three hundred and fifty million dollars less for Yahoo due to their cyber breach. So those um, those items have actually very high implications, um, and 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 we need to um, to be aware to be aware of them. Um, you know the cyber crime is now over a six hundred billion dollar um, transactional enterprise. So I, I said it is a it, it is a it's an enterprise. It is very very successful, and we know these numbers because we can actually track those through Bitcoin, and that's the the, the biggest or cryptocurrency. That's the biggest um, area. So that we're actually seeing these amounts of money actually being tra transferred to to hackers, uh, to the perpetrators. And um, and that's not even including the revenue, so if you, the, the revenue loss and the damage that are actually happening to those organizations. So it, it's a, it's a serious problem these days. Um, and and the last point that I want to make, and I'll talk about it a bit later on, is that a lot of those attacks are actually uh, state sponsored. Um, we have uh, sanctions against countries like um, Russia, like um, like um, Iran and North Korea, those regimes, or Hezbollah, or different terrorist organizations, those regimes, in order to actually fund the, the regime due to the lo revenue loss of the sanctions, are actually using cyber crime as a means to actually uh, fill the, get the money to, in order to, 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 to run those countries. So a lot of those, a lot of times that we're actually dealing here, the, the biggest challenge that we have you as a small business or even us as a business that's supposed to help customers protect it, we're actually dealing with very, very deep pockets, very organized, very organized, deep pockets. Like I'm not now fighting against a kid that is sitting in his basement and has a few computers. I'm not trying to fight against a country like Iran. It takes us to, to a different level. Uh, by the way, everyone can hear me properly. I just want to confirm, like, wait, okay, good. Um, so just a few points about, uh, and I'll put myself down because this is hiding my screen, uh, what the government of Canada is saying about cybersecurity. So, you know, 94% of business in Canada had some level of um, expenditure or preventing uh, to detect cybersecurity, right? And the big investments are actually done by by large businesses and even small businesses spend about for close to forty-four thousand uh, dollars. So there's on one hand, it's it's a very big cost for for a business, but but the reality is that this is um, a fractional compared to the damages. And I, I I just the past week I've had uh, the past ten days. So it's usually they start on weekends. You know, we had four customers that were different scenarios of of, of uh, impact, and and the, whether it, whether it's the cost of the of the ransom that you have to pay because you didn't have the proper backups, or whether or is the time that you lose because your business is down and you can't operate and the servers and you need to rebuild it and the IT and getting the experts. At the end of the day, really, the cost of uh, something of the prevention is, is fractional compared to, compared to the investment. And even that is quite a bit, like $44,000, if you think about a small business out of their uh, the, the pocket, that's, that's uh, money you're not taking home. So very conscious to the fact that it's, 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 not, it's not an easy thing. Um, the other point is that two thirds of businesses allow their employee to use personal devices for business purposes. Um, I don't think at this point in time that we, we can actually prevent it. And we've even seen COVID where suddenly all our staff went home. Uh, not everyone went and bought laptops to their employees that they continue working from home. What that brings is another level of complexity to the to organizations right now 
because now I'm now now I'm having a, an employee connecting into my network into my business where I do not have control. I don't know if he's updating his system. I don't even know if he has any any software. I don't know what he does with his personal computer at home. So this is really adding a huge element of complexity and and risk to the to the business. Um, and again, one fifth of Canadian businesses, I think the number is actually low, uh, impacted uh, cybersecurity incident. So. I am sure any every one of you know people that have been breached. I don't know if you guys had been breached or not, but the the reality is that it's, it's a it's a real issue and it's actually growing significantly. Um, I'll go quickly through this so we can get into the meat. But uh, you know, adversaries are getting more advanced and really targeting SMBs because you are an easy target. Um, you know, the number of endpoint and that's devices that with sensitive data that need to be protected is is increasing like we our cell phones now have have data we have all these applications so there's so many pieces now that needs to be protected our data is going into the cloud the cloud made it easier for us now i don't need to have a exchange server i, I register to office 365 and five minutes later on i have a and, and email in the cloud and my data is in my cloud, but the cloud is not always protected. So you need to understand that moving to the cloud is adding a lot of agility, but unless you're saying, okay, now I'm going to buy protection on the cloud, and there's a misconception that the cloud is actually giving you more protection. Um, you know, we, we grow, we become more digitized, Every time we become digitized, whether it's a website and access to our, uh, our website, to our customers to look at data, um, whether we, we bring IoT into the environment, all these, we call, it, we call it attack surface, we're increasing our attack surface. Now I have another entry point for someone in order to go into my, my environment. I'm opening a machine for remote desktop, or what we call RDP now, I have now, a, a tunnel that I just enabled to get into my into my business, and someone that knows how to exploit it is going to try to explore this. So um, these are new things. These are things that again we can't ignore them. Um, you know, cyber regulations are challenging organizational. Just yesterday, uh, October first, someone in the U.S. decided that you know we can't continue paying ransom and funding all those organizations that we're actually putting sanctions against. So if someone pays ransom to someone to, to, uh, to, to Iran, and we will find that it was at the end paid to Iran, of course, you don't know who you're paying ransom for, the sanctions actually can apply to you. So this is something else that the treasury came just October 1st, and I was like, hmm, so I'm now in ransom. You're not protecting me against those perpetrators, but at the other hand, uh, you're also not giving me and you're telling me I can't pay the ransom to get my data back. So what do you want me to do? So there's even, I think regulation is a bit uh, um, confused and not really sure what to do. Um, and uh, see if there's anything here. Da, da, da. In 60% of the cases, about attacks will be able to compromise the organization within minutes. So, and, and this is the reality, like, um, and I'll talk about a use case that just happened um, at, two weeks ago, uh, actually a week and a half ago, it, it takes one bad click. And, you know, if you do not have the proper protection, someone is in your environment. And they're not running a virus half the time, and they're not going to, they're actually trying to get a foothold in your organization, and then they decide what to do with it. Okay, and, and, and really, once someone is in your, your environment, you know, it says here it takes over six months even to realize you have been breached. That's big companies. Half, most of the time, you don't even know that someone is in your environment. We see customers that they land in, they go in, they turn off your backups, they leave a few back doors, and they disappear. And you know what? Six months, eight months, even a year later, or whatever the time period is, they will remember that they did it, they'll get back to you, they say, oh yeah, the backup is still off, boom, throw a ransom, and then you find yourself disabled. So a lot of times, the, the, it really takes them fast to go in, and, and they'll be there for a long time without us even knowing. Um, so very, I, I covered some of it, you know, attackers come from, you know, you have organized crime, 
um, which is a big part of it. We have nation states, uh, we have some hacktivists. We actually have also nations that are doing it like China, mainly for IP purposes. You have countries like Russia that like mendeling with other countries' politics. There's different uh, reasons to do it. We have the, the cyber terrorists, we have hacktivists that want to, to prove a point. But, but the bottom line is that a, a lot of those organizations are actually very organized. There are individuals that are also doing it in order to, to profit as individuals, but we're seeing more and more it's actually organized. Now, one thing to understand is just like we're buying the Office 65, uh, which is a SaaS-based solution, we all know it, we all like it. There are companies in the dark web selling uh, ransomware as a service. So you can actually go connect to the service, you say who your list of victims, you use the software, you pay for the software use and you actually pay them a percentage of, the, of what you get ransom. And they give you a call center behind it and all, it's a great business to be in. But this is what we're dealing with. You're not really dealing with amateurs, you're actually dealing with very, very sophisticated organizations. Um, so uh, just talk a little bit, uh, I, I want you to understand a bit how a, a, an attack um, unfolds and then we'll talk about various methods. So first, you need to understand that ev almost every attack starts with intelligence gathering. They're not just, there, there are some what we call drive-by shootings that they'll send it to uh, 10,000, just like a spam email and then see what hits. The reality is that most of the time, there's a lot of intelligence gathering. You see it in the sophisticated spam messages that you sometimes are getting that are relevant, that are contextual. They might take the data that was stolen from uh, Life Labs or Facebook or CRA or any other uh, place that they manage hacking and getting the information, put that into context, look at your Facebook account, look at your LinkedIn, do some research on, the, on who they're attacking on social media, and then they actually send the email that they're trying the phishing. Most of the email, the phishing today, entry points, actually 90% of them are actually coming through phishing emails. So phishing has, or an email that made you click. So when I say phishing, it wasn't just to grab information sometimes, it just had you open a file. And I've talked to a lot of, I've had a case just last week where someone hacked into a, a customer of an accounting firm they were in their system, they got in, and, and we'll see it later in the, in the, in the thing I sent, send them actually a, a reply to an email where they started, the con there was a conversation, they knew it was an accounting firm. The file itself had, of course, uh, my financial records or my expense report or whatever is relevant for them. Now you, it can be a customer sending you here my insurance forms. There's no reason for you not to open it. You know, it's your customer, they send you an updated insurance form, which of course you'll open it, right? And that's essentially the entry point to the organization. What then a hacker usually does, there's a communication that goes to a, what is CNC's command and control server, essentially someone from the outside that has access to this and now he can talk to your computer. From that point, they start doing lateral movement, which means how do I get from the machine that I landed on into the remaining of the network? There's a lot of methods of elevating um, privileges. I don't want to get into the technicalities here, but essentially is I landed in one machine. I want to make sure that I infect all the other machines, get as much foothold as I can. I'll find all your uh, file storage, all your databases. I will go into your QuickBooks to make sure I understand how much money you're making. So when I do it, ransom you at the end, I actually know how much money I can ask you. Now they're going for 10% uh, of your revenue, right? Instead of in the past with $500 for a machine, why do that? And, and also based on the ransom that they're asking, you understand the level of sophistication and how long they spend in your environment. They upload the data into an external server, so they have backup, they can use it, they can resell it. And some there, there's a missing 0.7 here. I downloaded it from the internet. Uh, I had another one, did look as well essentially would be something that you would know that they attacked you. They'll, you'll, you'll now get the ransom, you'll get hit, but that can be, as I mentioned, weeks. They might have 
you know, turn the back off that all, all this work, seeing what you have in your environment that is of value to them before they hit you at the end. Uh, so really the ransomware in many cases, actually three, four weeks, months after they actually have been in your environment. Um, so I've talked enough. Uh, Kat, do you want to go over some of those things? I will go over some things. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's two main different ways that, that uh, hackers get into your account. And one of them is through people and one of them is through technical stuff and devices and emails and texts. So here's two really great examples of what we call phishing. So phishing, as Gilad had mentioned, is when you get a message and that message contains some kind of a link, a download, an attachment, and clicking on that link takes you somewhere that you shouldn't go, or it downloads something it shouldn't. Uh, the general term for that is malware. Anyone who speaks French, mal is bad. So any kind of bad software is going to be malware. Um, and it depends on the different kinds of situations. So. One example here uh, is a text message that claimed it was coming from a bank. Uh, and another one is um, a payment message from Netflix. When you look at the URL, which is the website address, the end of the address should be the website you're going to. So in the case of the one that says Bank of Montreal, bmo.com is Bank of Montreal's website. But this website is going to 119-SSL-43-54-SL.com. So it's the last portion before the .com. That's where it's actually going. So that's an easy way to spot this. Uh, same thing here with this Netflix email. It says it's from Netflix, but that email is certainly not a Netflix email address. Uh, we will be talking about spoofing, which shows the wrong email address. But in this case, uh, be very careful when you're clicking on links that you're not expecting. No service will ever email you to log directly into the service. What it will do is send you a message that says you need to go and update your credit card because your expiry date has changed, or you need to go in and change something because of this other reason. It will not give you a link to take you directly to that website. So whenever you see that, you can kind of become a little suspicious of this phishing. Um, as it says, 94% of malware is delivered via email. And, and that's how that's getting in. Um, social engineering is a little bit different. So the lab had kind of touched on it. I have a soft spot for social engineering. It's not digital. Social engineering is, it's a means to an end. It's how we use people to get something from them. Um, it might be the same way you ask for something at the desk of a hotel because you're trying to get extra towels and, and you do something really nice in order to get them to do it. Social engineering is just the ability to manipulate people socially. But what's happened with digital technology is that hackers have found ways to take information to manipulate people. And some of that information, as Galata mentioned, is coming from things as simple as your open social networks. So the, you will hear in terms of phishing, so phishing is a general, I'm gonna reach out to a bunch of people and see who I can catch, like phishing, like catching a fish. You will hear sometimes the terminology spear phishing or even whale phishing. So spear phishing is a targeted attack and whale phishing is a targeted attack at the big fish, uh, often at a CEO or CTO or someone at, that's the head of the company. So if I wanted to social engineer your dental office and I could find in the primary dentist, the office owner, even a hygienist, if I could find someone online who is sharing a lot of information on the social network, that allows me to call into the office and say, oh, hi, I'm looking for Brenda. Brenda's not there right now. Oh, I know Brenda because her kids play softball with my kids and she told me to call in and, and she left something there and can you just come quickly go on her computer and do this? Uh, there's a hundred different ways to do this. And I, I will admit like as a woman, I try and pull this off sometimes just to see how many people will be nice to me and most people are nice to me. So uh, I will go into offices and pretend I belong there or say that I just need to use the washroom for a minute. I'm not in COVID, but before that, <laughs> lots of people would let me into offices uh, to use the washroom if you're nice to them. Um, and so that's kind of the social engineering, uh, social engineering aspect of gaining access into other people's accounts. So you have to be careful what trail of information you're leaving out. And then when someone comes back to you with a lot of knowledge about you, wonder whether or not that's actually knowledge that they know or if it's something they've picked up online. Okay, next one. So we've talked a lot about ransomware. Uh, ransomware has become pretty much one of the leading ways that, uh, that people are getting hit with these cyber attacks. So essentially ransomware closes your access 
to your data. It can come in different forms. So ransomware can be just the access. It's, it's possible that you just can't get into your systems. You can't unlock your doors. Maybe your phones are down. Uh, depends on what your computer runs. I think we really take for granted right now how much we are digitizing and, and automating and having run by systems. Um, or ransomware could be access to the data where the hacker actually has a copy of the data. Uh, it's very difficult to, to mitigate all of, all of these things. So that's what Gilad's going to do an example or a case study to explain a ransomware. Um, but what, when it comes to ransomware, having a backup, it often can mitigate this. So if your ransomware, someone is taking the copy of your data and you need a second copy of your data, then having a backup will allow you to do that. Backup system and a backup set of data. When you look at ransomware closing you down, uh, it, that means you can't operate your business. So not only are you losing the money and time for that day, but then you now have to go back and reschedule patients and put everything on another day. You've got to fit that somewhere else. So the cost to ransomware isn't the downtime. It's the downtime plus everything it takes to fix it. Uh, in addition, of course, to the ransomware demands, which is coming in, in a money, in cost. Yep. Next. So we talked a little bit about spear phishing and the, and the whale phishing. Um, one thing that's become popular is spoofing. And this one is really hard to detect. So if you've ever received an email from a newsletter, that newsletter looks like it's being sent by the person who runs the company, or it looks like you may even have your own for your dental office. You might send a newsletter via something else and it says that it's from your dental office. It's not actually coming from your server. It's coming from somewhere else with a reply to address. Um, and so what people are able to do with spoofing is spoof email addresses. So they either you will show the name of someone else or they will show the name and you could even display the email address to someone else, uh, depending on what it is. If I was trying to insert malware with an attachment, then I could send an email and even have the regular, I could have the correct reply to address in the from, uh, but as long as you click on my attachment and download it, then I've gotten what I've gotten and you've already downloaded the malware that I wanted you to. So this one's become much harder to detect and uh, one of the big things with spoofing is to make sure that you have software products on the servers that you use your email with because that is the best way to detect when something's coming in from somewhere where it shouldn't be. Okay, next one. So unattended USB devices. I, you know, if anyone has kids or you, you tell them not to look at something, they'll go look at something. Uh, just generally with people, if you say don't open that box, they'll open the box. Uh, so unattended USB devices are a fantastic way to get malware onto computers. And what hackers will do is they'll walk into offices and just drop them on the ground. Leave a USB, just drop it on the ground. Somebody comes in, oh, I wonder what this is. And they plug it into their computer uh, and then they check to see what it is. You know what you can even do with a USB drive is you could put malware on it and then you could stick 17 random pictures of a Florida vacation. So, you know, you put it in, you're like, oh, I guess that's some vacation photo and they lost it, but it's too late because the software has already put itself onto your system. It is best to have a policy in your office, which you should have a number of privacy policies, but you should definitely have a security and privacy policy that says that your staff should never put unidentified USB drives in any computer on your system ever. Um, and as Gilad mentioned again, it doesn't always come right away. So someone could find the USB, they could plug it in, and then three weeks later you could have ransomware and no one's gonna trace that back to that one USB disk and one USB device that you put in. So it should definitely be a habit or a policy or all of the above not to put it in. Even better is when you write confidential on the USB that is guaranteed to have someone plug it in. So a great chart here, parking lots, um, and in your case certainly, waiting rooms or even in a dental room because it looks like it came out of someone's pocket and you're trying to check that. So do not plug those in. Next one. And man in the middle attack. So the man in the middle attack uh, is when you're trying to connect to a Wi-Fi and somebody basically comes in the center. It's as if you're trying to pass a note to a friend and someone else comes and takes the note, reads it, closes it, and then passes it to the friend. You've passed your note, your friend got the note. So from where you're concerned, everything's fine. You don't realize that someone has actually read it in the middle. This is a very popular attack in free Wi-Fi access. So we have to be very careful to let your staff know that they should not be connecting to free Wi-Fi when using business email, business devices, business anything. Um, as soon as you stick in your name and your password and a free Wi-Fi, someone else could intercept that 
They could see that you have a password there and then you still again get into your web application. Maybe you've put in a credit card number, but that person in the middle has taken the data. Next one. And then cyber attacks at home. So as Galad mentioned, this has become a really big thing. Um, I'm not gonna spend time talking about privacy regulations tonight just because we're, we're stuck on time. If anyone has any questions about them, my email address is there or you can throw them in the questions. But from a privacy regulation perspective, from a dental perspective, you need to be HIPAA compliant or if you're in Canada, you need to be provincially compliant with the health regulations you have. If you are using a video service in order to serve your clients. Those services, by definition, are compliant as long as they're not recording. However, you still need to be compliant. So what I'm seeing is a lot of medical services going online using something like Zoom, and then you've got children, roommates, spouses, anyone walking in the background listening to that conversation renders it no longer compliant. So the tool is compliant, but you still need to make sure you're using it in a safe way. The other thing you wanna be very careful with from home is sending messages back and forth. So if you have an email and you're sending x-rays, medical information, again, sending that stuff via regular email is not privacy regulation compliant. So you want to make sure that you have a different service or system, some kind of file transfer system would be ideal, especially if you're dealing with medical information so that users can download it on their own. Um, I currently have uh, orthodontic, but I have my daughter's orthodontic x-rays sitting on my laptop. Um, so in a regular email account, again, I'm not worried about that. That's not really private, but at the same time, uh, that is medical information that shouldn't technically be sent. Uh, using regular email systems. So that should be sent in a more secure way. Um, the other thing you need to be very careful with when you're working from home is everyone connected to your network. So your network is a castle and you can have all the security set up that you want, but if the cook leaves the back door open and it's unguarded, then it doesn't matter what security you have in your castle because everyone can get in. If you have people using um, devices, especially again, if you have roommates, children, if anyone's using a device and that device downloads malware, then your entire system becomes susceptible to that malware. So you want to be very careful of what's coming in. Thanks, Ken. So just a bit of uh, things that we've seen since COVID, because I think it was, it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, we've seen phishing increase by as much as 400%. Um, according to some uh, sources. And, and again, I think the reason is people's anxiety went up, people needed to know what's happening. Uh, so at the beginning, it was uh, messages with uh, Center of Disease Control Prevention and the WHO, and there were uh, country specific organizations. And later on, it's like uh, PPE availability, but um, but, but this is a, a serious issue and a, and a big driver for that that we're seeing now, uh, we're seeing almost the same amount of increase in, um, in ransomware. We have a lot of software engineers unemployed in China, in India, in other countries because a lot of businesses have actually got hit hard and those people still need to feed their families. So unfortunately, uh, an easy way for a lot of them is, is to go the, maybe the, the bad route, but uh, it, it's a reality and we're really seeing a huge spike uh, in the last, uh, especially in the last quarter of a lot more uh, customers being, uh, being hit. Um, and, and, you know, and we're seeing that criminals are actually not, sh not really showing any boundaries. You know, we're seeing uh, hospitals get hit, lab tests get hit, um, you know, a big, uh, just in September 18th, the hospital in New Jersey was hit with a ransomware on the 19th that patients died in another, in, uh, in another hospital. So, you know, attackers are, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there's not too much conscious and they're actually going to try exploiting um, whatever what they want. And, and exploiting the lack of security at home is, was also a big driver to that. So now I have all these employees working from home on personal computers, accessing com company networks. Uh, so I don't, probably most of you don't know, but with the hack that happened many years ago 
in Target, essentially uh, when they stole um, millions of credit card numbers was done through actually a third party. It was through the HVAC guy that was supposed to just log in and manage a few things and connect into the, into the Target network. And, and he did, but when an attacker actually landed on his machine and when he logged into Target, now they were in Target's network and from there, uh, we know what happened, right? So it's, 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 it's a different scenario, but again, working from home now actually opened up all these other businesses into that. So if you do have staff working from home, you know, you may want to consider making sure at least that they have your approved antivirus or some sort of security measures that you have a bit, at least some control over it. Um, I do want to talk about a case study that actually from the last two weeks, and, and I actually want to use a, a positive case in this case, because um, I, I do not see too many of those out there. So we had a case, it, it happened last, um, not last Friday, the Friday before, one of the administrators in an accounting firm opened the document. She saw that it wasn't, she enabled content, she didn't do everything, but she, she, she said something wasn't right. Went immediately to her boss. Luckily, the IT guy was there. Within 20 minutes, 15 minutes, they disconnected the machine from the network. Said, "Okay, this is, this is not not disconnect the machine from the network." So, step one: isolate the problem. Right? I got a phone call. They said, "Look, we wanna roll an EDR. EDR essentially is an endpoint detection response. It's the next generation of antiviruses." If, if, if you guys don't have, write it down, go ask your IT. If you don't have them, you don't, he doesn't have one for you, fire him. Because today the, the Nortons and the McAfee's, they just do not stop viruses. They stop about 80%, but that's not enough. So he called me, he said, look, we were supposed to roll it next week. Can you roll it in my environment? Within two hours, we had the entire office, uh, 50 machines with an EDR installed. Now at least what, what the EDR gives me, it's like an antivirus, but it has a console. It gives me, uh, me or, or the IT guy, eyes into really what's happening on the environment. It has forensic capabilities. So it really has the ability now to, to really see what's happening on the machines from a malicious activity. And you know, nothing happened. We went through the weekend, all was quiet. Came on the morning and suddenly the admins, I, I, a computer woke up and started, we started trying to deploy, run code. And that's again, what the EDR gives me the ability to go and see what's happening in the environment. It took us exactly, so aid was blocking the events, but we didn't even take any risk. We, I had to the, the, the tool or that they could have done it manually. We said, we're isolating this device. We know that there's something code bad ran on it. No time, no, no point even spending on, on the forensics. Take the machine, burn it. So, re, and I'm joking, but re-image the machine, build a new, build it from scratch, and, and the machine will be up and running. And essentially that's what we did. We stopped the, the infection. And that the first thing that thing, so when we looked at the code, was trying actually to, to infect all the other machines on the network. So we stopped that activity, all was good. The interesting thing, the next day on Tuesday, suddenly we get a call from two different customers or that they actually got so got a message. What happened was within that 15 minutes that the hacker got a hold of the machine, and again, this is actually a customer that got it from another customer. They downloaded the mailbox of the admin. They didn't have access to their mail, but they spoofed her email. So they just took the mailbox. They went into conversations that she had with other people, did a reply, attached the malware put some context, they changed the file name to something that made sense. In that case, it was compensation, or compensation coming from your accountant, or I don't remember what was exactly the subject. The guy opened it, called them, and then that's, and that's how it essentially is propagated. You want, they, they're trying to, pro, to get as many people hit as possible. But again, if I look at it, why is it the good news? Because, you know, what, what, what did prevent, what could have prevented it having a, a proper anti-malware solution and EDR. They didn't have it, but within two hours, all the network had it, right? And, and, and that really saved them, right? Because, and, and I think the most important here, and I wanted to take it away. So they had a security communication and awareness training. So they did training for their employees. Their employees knew if there's an issue, something happened, report it. Don't hide it. 
you know, a lot of times people are ashamed that they open a bad email and then they won't tell anyone. She immediately notified it. They explained that they had an awareness training. Employees knew what to do. The second piece is, you know, they had a quick response. They isolated the machine. They had an incident plan ahead of time. So they knew what to do. They had a number to call. They called their IT guy. He called me and, and, the, and the problem rolled into place. And, 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 and that's, that's almost as, as important in a case in a scenario because I worked with another dentist all last weekend and he had the exact opposite scenario. He has actually, he has an, an, an assistant in, the, in, the, in his practice, open a file, she saw something run. She did call her IT guy. They didn't, just didn't do anything, ah, don't worry about it. And, and two weeks later, we were working all weekend in order to fix his environment. And, and we saw that the malware was now in all the machines. So now he needs to, to replace all the machines in his practice, to rebuild all the machines in his practice. We need to build a, rebuild the server in his practice. Luckily, we, we, when he called me, we installed the EDR and we managed stopping or it did, I don't even know what, what point it would have started the ransom, but we called them before they decided to turn on the ransom at the, at the end. But they were in his environment for at least two weeks. And to be honest, in two weeks, they could have done so much damage and taken all this data. I, at this point, I don't even know what they've done because most of you, like they don't, you don't have proper firewalls, you don't have logging. You're a small business, I don't expect it from you, but just make sure, and, and the message I wanna take, drive here is like, to drive, you know, drive the, uh, just like we challenge our employees to, to do better in their practice, challenge your IT company, ask the questions. If you do not know, invite people like Kat and myself, we'll jump on the call with you guys and help you do it because that is so critical. And again, this is the difference between being now down for two weeks or paying ransom and, and uh, or losing uh, your entire weekend, a lot of stress to essentially stopping it within a very short period of time with very little impact. Um, just looking at the time here, so, Few things about the set, def defending against cyber attacks. I won't get into this. This is the NIST uh, cybersecurity uh, framework. Essentially what it says, we need to have the proper tools in place so that we can identify what something happened, protect, detect it, and then the ability to respond. I, I really, this with the time that we have, I just don't wanna, it's just too much uh, to go into. Um, and, um, and you know, I'll pass it over to, to Kat. We'll talk a few about a few best practices and then we'll we'll wrap it up because also we want to leave some time for questions. Yeah, okay. So so really good cyber hygiene is critical. There are little things you can do to protect yourself. Um, the first one is our password best practice, which uh, treat like a toothbrush, uh, choose a good one, change it often, and don't share it with others. And the thing with passwords, as Gilad already mentioned, is credential stuffing has become really popular. And so credential stuffing is what he'd mentioned where you get your password and email combination from one hack service and you use it on another. If anyone remembers when Disney Plus was released and like 25% of accounts were claimed to be hacked, what that actually was, was the password and email combinations from the Yahoo hack that happened years earlier. And they just went and plugged them all into Disney Plus and locked out on a whole bunch of them. So please make sure your passwords are non-language, very easy to guess easy language passwords, like you know the whole use a letter, use a number, or use a whatever. Um, and then consider using a password manager because password managers will create passwords for you that are long and unguessable and have a combination of characters in them. So multi-factor authentication, uh, this is where you need more than one thing to actually log in. Typically in the systems in your office, you probably are gonna just want a password because you need quick and easy access. If you have systems, like if your office is connected to a bank, you should definitely have multi-factor authentication set up. So something you know is the password, that's an easy one. Um, something you have could either be a key, like if you have a VPN, like a virtual private network that you're coming in from home, sometimes there'll be a key that actually comes up with a new passcode every time. Um, and then something you are is um, any kind of biometrics. So that's facial recognition, voice recognition. Uh, those are a little bit harder to get, but certainly the something you know and something you have. Something you have also is your phone. 
So if you ever sign up for something and then it calls you and sends a message to your phone and you need to use that passcode as well as the password, that would be the multi-factor authentication. It is recommended for every major account, anything that houses critical information should have multi-factor authentication set up. Next one. And then security for smart devices. So smart devices are everywhere. They're kind of the bane of my existence from a privacy perspective because their microphones are almost always on. Uh, so I talk about compliance and I'm gonna go back there again. You are not HIPAA compliant if you have a phone in the office and that phone has a microphone turned on. You are not HIPAA compliant if you have some kind of device that listens to you all the time. Uh, my favorite example was a fellow cybersecurity professional who was buying a house and he went into the small real estate office and the, they said please call your bank and then tell them to transfer the money and he had to give his account number off the phone and he said hold on a minute do you have alexa playing music in the office and the guy was like of course we do and he's like okay well i'm not gonna give you my bank account number while your alexa is sitting there listening um so from a compliance perspective you have to be careful even when you're putting those kinds of devices it should, makes it great to play music but if there's any kind of microphone involved, any kind of camera involved, then you could be breaching privacy. Uh, you also want to make sure when you do attach things, if you get something new in the office and you're attaching it up to your router again, this is that castle. If you open up a door, then none of your other security matters. So the minute you add a new device into your network, you have to make sure you change the default password because that's an easy way for hackers to get in. Um, anytime you see an update, make sure you update that software because it's probably patching a security co code to it. Uh, and then don't connect anything if you don't need to. If you see like a big sale on, on Black Friday for a coffee maker that you think would be awesome for the office because you could turn it on before people get in, that coffee maker is another hole in your security if something goes wrong. So if you don't need to have things connected to the internet, we're gonna go back a couple decades and we're just not gonna connect things to the internet from a security perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. So again, this is, uh, I wanted to just show you here quickly. Uh, you know, I covered it before of uh, what, what is an EDR. Um, and again, you see, this is actually an image where I can actually see all the activities that are happening. I can see what the, the virus is doing. And actually on the bottom, you see how suddenly a process spins and starts going crazy. There's a lot of different images like this, but essentially you need to, to, in today's world, you need something that will tell you Okay, that will be able to actually see those activities, have machine learning ability, and say this is something wrong because the hacker is trying to use various techniques in order to break into your organization. So I don't want to dwell into it too much, but essentially this is what uh, uh, I want to show you what an EDR is. And, and again, something that um, in today's world, uh, and again, just to understand, like if you're paying today three, four bucks a month from for a, uh, an old antivirus, you're going to be paying six bucks for an EDR per month. Uh, that that's the difference that we're talking about. So, so for a, a two dollars, three dollars per month for, on a machine, this is the difference between getting hacked and not getting hacked if you have the proper tools in your environment. Um, Kat, you want to cover us uh, the good some best practices here? Yep, so just to sum everything up, so there is a page again that Joanne mentioned that you can download or that will be sent and um, that has some tips on it as a reminder so you can print that off and, and share it with staff. Uh, so number one here is being aware of the scams. Really, and your staff needs, everyone in your staff needs to be aware of these scams. Like we said, um, phishing and spoofing and not clicking on things that aren't coming from reliable people, verifying addresses. Uh, always using protected Wi-Fi for any of your business connections, not putting any kind of private information over public Wi-Fi, using passwords that are unique and hopefully complicated, and setting multi-factor authentication in your key accounts, which I just mentioned, um, IoT, not using it if you don't need it, but if you need it, set those default passwords and change them to something better. Um, applying all those software updates. Again, they get masked as something else. I know with iOS, they're like, hey, look, new emojis, but really there's a bunch of security things in there. So always apply those software updates. I'm uh, glad just mentioned that protect your systems with endpoint protection, not just virus backup. Um, and have a ransomware proof backup. Have some kind of backup where you know that if ransomware hits, 
it's not taking your business down. Do you still have to deal with it? Absolutely. But if you've got a backup somewhere where you can get up and running again, then at least you can keep your business running during that issue. Um, and then one more. So as I said, assume your device is listening all the time, all the time. So if you're bringing devices, smart TVs even, people are taking meetings from their living rooms in front of their smart TVs. All of these IoT devices have microphones and unless you've explicitly gone in and turned them off, they are listening because they're listening for you to call their name essentially and wake them up. Um, if you do have cameras on any of your devices, you should have some kind of physical cover to cover them because the software that shuts them off is not always reliable. And uh, you should, as a, as a person, you should be checking your credit score once a year um, or get monitoring service if you think you're at risk. Uh, just because, unfortunately, information does get out there. And as you said, there's, it, it could take months or years and your information could be traded out there and you might not even know. So it's definitely worth watching that. And just as a little added tip not here, if you are a parent, there's a very popular scam where um, if hackers can get hold of kids' birth dates, uh, they can create social assurance numbers, they can create credit, and then your child won't even know until they turn 18 or 19 and go to apply for a credit card, and then all of a sudden they have low credit. And so people don't think to check the credit for a child because, uh, because they shouldn't have credit, but that is a scam that people do use where they look for, uh, especially people posting on Facebook and saying, hey, happy 10th birthday to my wonderful kid, and then there's first name, middle name, last name, and a date. Um, so that's often what hackers need in order to create that. So I think we do have time for questions. Indeed. Does anybody have any questions? They can post them in the Q&A. Until people do, like I think having a proper backup, again, is, is the difference between needing to pay back ransom and not needing to pay ransom and at least keeping the control. So you might still need to, you might lose a few days, you might need to uh, restore the data and rebuild a few machines, but at least you're, hey, really we're not, we're, we, we don't want to continue supporting those organized crimes and, and those regimes that which are really problematic out there and 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 you really don't want you want it's, it's a difference between a bad day and a really really bad day it's, it's okay to rebuild a few machines you can do it within a few hours and you're up and running but when you're like and, and i'm saying when customers have actual ransom like the cost to the organization usually is about five times more the cost of just the ransom that you've paid. Wow. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, have you got your contacts up here? This has been recorded and I'm sure people will be checking in and listening to it in the days to come as well. Um, everybody will get a handout. And uh, Heidi, a questionnaire as well, a survey? Yes, they will. Thank you so much for attending. We appreciate, I appreciate everyone's time this evening. And Thank you. If there, that in time. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and if there's no questions, we can wrap. Have a great evening, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>